Hi, everybody. This is Anne Marie, the anti HR HR lady. And today we are going to talk about can white people be taught empathy? And there's no way that I could have this conversation without my dear friend and special guest, Tammy Triolo, of the creator of the Empathy Scorecard and an HR specialist and a DEI um, expert who talks about these issues from the context of empathy and with empathy at, the, at its center. Um, but first, this is the anti-HR channel where I talk to employees about HR issues and workplace rights. I try to educate employees about interactions with HR, understanding human resources better, and understanding their workplace rights so that they are ready to assert them if they believe they're being violated. If that's of interest to you, please hit the like, subscribe, and comment constructively, and share this channel with a friend. So, Tammy, thank you for being here. We are good. I've been wanting to talk about this for a while, and you know, I've been talking a lot about whiteness and white supremacy mm -hmm. and the impact of whiteness and white supremacy on different demographics that we interact with in the workplace. And mm -hmm. the issue of empathy keeps coming up in my mind as I talk about this. And I was like, who else could I talk to but Tammy about the issue <laughs> of empathy? Because she is the expert on talking about these issues and how they impact how we all interact with each other, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I would love for you to kind of introduce yourself to everyone, um, tell them a little bit about yourself before we get into this conversation and about your empathy scorecard, which I think is something everyone should know about and get, grab um, and, and take that test, all of us. So oh. you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll get into this conversation about the, my question of whether white people can learn empathy. Thanks, Anne. I am really happy to be here. You're one of my favorite people. So thank you for having me on. My name is Tammy Triolo. I am the creator of the Empathy Scorecard. I'm also the founder and principal consultant at PCQ Consultant, where we help companies create a better culture with empathy at its, uh, at its core. Um, I have been doing this work um, in the human resources DEI space for about 10 years now. Um, and when I started doing this work, one of the things that I was constantly running into was people asking, why hasn't anything changed? We're doing all this training. We have all this DEI stuff. We're hiring all these people and we're still in the same place. Why hasn't anything changed? And my simple answer to that is because the people with the power to change it for us have no empathy for us. Um, and that, that doesn't matter whether we're talking about race or gender or sexuality. A lot of the times the people in positions of power that has the ability to change things for us do not have empathy for us. And so I started to talk about empathy and the importance of it and how we need to cultivate it more in ourselves. And for those of us who lack it to develop it in ourselves. And so, yes, I think empathy can be taught, but it has to also be modeled. So when you, when you connect with your empathy, you then have to start modeling behaviors that demonstrate empathy. So that's who I am. Thank you so much for talking to us today, Tammy. And so I want to, you know, lay a little groundwork for this conversation and saying that for a long time, I have not been able to quite put my finger on what the issue was about why the, we were not making more progress than we have mm -hmm. been for all mm -hmm. this time. Um, mm -hmm. Not just in the United States, but in the world, honestly, world. because anti-Black, yeah. especially anti-Black racism is a global thing. As someone who's yeah. traveled to 40 countries, I've talked about this before on multiple platforms that the issue of anti-Black racism, racism is not limited to the United States. It's a global issue, right? Um, right. That colonialism and slavery, it's a global yeah. issue. So even in countries that are majority Black and Brown, you will see these things show up, right? Yes. Um, because we have been taught as people of color that we are supposed to be inferior to people yes. with white skin. Uh, but yes. in U but in the U.S., I always say, you know, racism is a very, very specific and particular thing in the United States of America. And it the is. way that it is embedded in the structure of everything is unlike yeah. anywhere else I've ever been. Right. Right. And so when we talk about, you know, these things, they show up at work. Right. And in order to address them, as you said, the issue is about people recognizing that the need for empathy, right? Yeah. Can yeah. you first of all define what you mean when you talk about empathy? What do you mean by empathy, right? And then can we talk a little bit about historically how it has come to be that mm -hmm. those in power um, have lost their empathy and how that shows up? 
So when I'm talking about empathy, most people start from the very rudimentary um, understanding of empathy, what the dic dictionary says, the ability to feel for somebody else and to put yourself in, in that person's shoes. But then I tell people, well, now that your feet are in those shoes, walk out what you would want to happen in your life, right? So it's not just about being in somebody's shoes, but if you are there, what would you do, right? So my conversations around empathy is getting people from not just feeling, right? Because we can all feel bad for people, but then we go on about our lives. Mm -hmm. Empathy requires you to do something more than just feeling for bad for people, right? So if I am out and about and I see somebody homeless, I can look at that person being on the street and feel bad for them, right? And I, But I could do something about that as much as I can. So the thing that I may be able to do is help them with food. I may be able to help them with resources. I may be able to connect them with somebody that can help them. So my empathy doesn't just stop at, I see that thing and I feel terrible for that thing, but then I go on about my day. It's I see that thing and what is in my power to do? What can I do for this person? What is in my control to do? And anything within our control to do is to demonstrate empathy in a real and practical way rather than just feeling. So I'm trying to talk to people about empathy being actionable, not, not just stagnant, but actionable. How do we take what we feel for people? How do we take what we, what we care about in people and make that actionable in their lives? And if you can get people to start operating from that place of empathy, the world shifts. The problem is we have a lot of people demonstrating sympathy and calling it empathy, right? So sympathy yeah. is, I feel really bad for you, but oof, completely grateful it's not my life. And then I can go on about my life. Empathy is, I feel bad for you. And if that were my life, what would I want somebody to do for me? So How would I, I want the other person to help me? And basically say, empathy requires action. Sympathy requires that you do nothing. Do sympathy nothing. Is just, you can just say, I'm so sad, glad it's not me, which is the yeah. way we react and we've been programmed to react, I would add, yes. In, yes. In, in a capitalist system, because we have been taught, and I say this all the time, and you talk about this a lot more than I do, um, <laughs> is that at the root of all of these things, whether we recognize this or not, is a battle between the haves and the have-nots, right? Yes. And yes. in order for the have, and the haves have used lots of different things, race in particular, yes. um, to divide people and keep them separated so that they continue to can have and we continue to, the majority of us continue to have not. No, However, right. one of the things that they have done so well is to teach us to hate poor people and to hate yes. someone that yes. we see as less than, yes. right? And so we can see people on the street. We can see people living in tent, tent houses and, and make them the bad guy. We don't yeah. question the system that allows it collectively. Correct. Individually, Correct. we might, but collectively, majority of us don't question a system that has allowed these things to occur. Don't see a responsibility for us to do anything to change. And I'll give you an example. I was reading in the paper, I was reading something yesterday, I think it was uh, um, where the Biden administration is proposing to put in place a rule that requires that airlines um, seat pa parents with young children together, right? If the if if the seat available is there, that they allow them to take that seat for free, right? To not charge, and that if they, you know, if people make a reservation and for whatever reason they move them because they do this, take it from someone who who travels, that they would have to reimburse the parent if they paid for to to sit together and then get on the plane and find that they can't that the airline has done something to cause them not to, and the comment section. Of all these people who were saying, well, I shouldn't have to pay or the airline shouldn't have to do this and you should plan better when they're literally trying to address an issue where people do plan, right? And I'm, I'm a member of the, I'm not giving my seat up for your child crew, right? <laughs> however, however, I'm a parent and I can see both sides of this, but right. that people actually do plan and make these reservations and then still find show up the day of flying and find that for whatever computer reason, they're not next to their kid anymore and the airline won't do anything to rectify it, but tell them, well, you can ask this person to move or you can whatever, and which causes interactions between passengers that shouldn't even have to happen, right? Correct. But the comment section, people were immediately like no empathy at all for the parent that might have a three-year-old and be told that their three-year-old isn't next to them, right? Yeah. They paid for a seat for their three-year-old to be next to them, right? Yeah. And the administration is trying to address that by holding the airlines accountable, 
right? Because the airlines are the ones that are charging for everything except breathing on these flights. Yeah. And we have a system <laughs> that has allowed that. But people jump from that immediately to attacking the parents, right? And defending a, a and whole defending, corporation and defending that's billionaires. And defending yeah. corporations. And that is an example to me of how programmed programmed we are as humans and citizens in the United States have become around defending corporate interests when, when it when it's actively harming them. Same Correct. thing with health care. Why should I have to pay for somebody else's health care is what you'll be told. Right. Yeah. Why should I have to pay for that? And instead, right. because they don't see any it as a right, they see that everything as something to be monetized and made money off of because right. they taught that. Right. right. And, 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 in, and in doing that, you lose your ability. You're losing. These are little things that over time that strips you away your empathy, the stripping away your empathy. And we only see it from the prism of race because again, we're not seeing that you're operating inside of a system it's that has you're operating been built to have a certain effect. Right. The system is like a cyclone and it will eventually encompass all of us. Right. And we're all in this cyclone of white supremacy, thinking that we have the moral high ground. Right. Whether you whether you think you have the moral high ground, whether it's your race or your gender or your sexuality, that we have the moral high ground on empathy. And a lot of us don't because capitalism is designed to rob us from it. Right. And so white people may not have empathy because they have been heavily indoctrinated into white supremacy to believe the lie that they are inherently better. But the rest of us, the rest of us have been conditioned to believe that we are better. We may be better based on our socioeconomic background. We may be better on our um, body size. We may be better on our skin tone, right? And so we're all conditioned into this hierarchical of better. And anytime you participate in a hierarchical of better, you are going to be robbed of your empathy. And you know, one of the things that I talk about, because I do do some personal coaching too, with clients that come into me and they say, well, particularly white clients that says, you know, I want to learn how to um, be a better ally for which, you know, I don't think this term even exists, like allies don't exist, but I'm using their language. How do I be a better ally? How do I advocate better for, for black people? And even in that question, they're coming into that relationship from a hierarchical perspective. It's like, how do I be better to the people down from me? And mm -hmm. I say to them, you got to ask yourself, how do you be better for you first? Because if you can be better for you, you can have this kind, you can have a horizontal relationship with people and not a lateral one where you are still above them and they are below you. And so doesn't matter what, what system we're bought into. If we're operating from hierarchical structures that we are somehow better than the other, we are all being stripped and robbed of empathy. And I think that's a very important point because I think that I see it a lot in my comments when yeah. I talk about these issues and, you know, I'm about to touch a third rail and somebody go feelings going to get hurt and that's okay. Just keep your comments constructive y'all. Cause you know how I roll. Just um, breathe. So a lot of us as black people, I'm talking about black people in particular. Yeah. Yeah. We are really um, bought into this. We're superior than them because we're better humans. Right. Yeah. And I will see people come into my comments and, you know, call people devils and demons and it's just, and they're evil and they're whatever. And I've, yeah. you know, really made a comment because I don't like it because I don't I like it either. I, I hate society. when they call white people devils and demons. I hate it too. I really do. But I'm going to say why, because I feel that one, because I don't believe that you should refer to any human being in that way. Yes. Right? Yes. And also yes. because I believe Using dehumanizing language to describe human beings is is the first step yes. towards justifying that you can do anything that you want to them. We've seen it throughout history. We've seen white people do it, right? Yeah. And yeah. so I feel that we as a group of people, collectively, not individually, have had the moral high ground for as long as we have because we have not lost our empathy. Yes. And I feel yes. like now in this time of social media where people feel they can get online and hide behind an avatar or a blank picture and then just say whatever they want. Yeah. What I am seeing is that many of us are also losing our empathy and that worries yeah. me a lot because I feel like when you start mimicking, and the problem for a lot of us is we don't want to be better. We want to be like them. We want yeah. what we have, which is why I talked about white, black heterosexual men sometimes functioning as the white people of the black community. And, you know, that got yeah. people, people in their feelings. They heard, they didn't hear nothing else I said in my video about white supremacy, whiteness and black men. That's all they heard. And they got in their feelings. Oh, I'm bashing black men. No, I'm not. I'm calling out a thing. 
right? Yeah. That a lot of us, the reason why we seek proximity so much is we want to be like them. We don't like what they do to us, but we would like to do it to other people. We want more specifically, to we'd like to do it to people who look like us too. Who look like us and who we feel should be um, subordinate to us, yes. right? Yes. And so we will see, someone asked me recently a question in my comments where they asked me, you know, did I think that if we started our own businesses and did our own, hired our own people, whether we would have less toxic workplaces? And I said, no. Why? Because when you have all black, for example, workplaces in my uh, observation and experience, the only issue you take out of the equation is race. That's it. People still will engage in discriminatory treatment based on all kinds of other things. Misogyny, right. ableism, classism, sexism, classism, right? I see older black women being horrible to younger black women and vice yep. versa, right? Because of jealousy, right? Colorism, right. all kinds of isms. The only ism it takes out is the racism. So if you have done the work, to, to recognize these things in yourself and actively seek to not participate in them. You right. perpetuate the same, you, you perpetuate a different set of isms against people that look like you, just That's not it. the racism one, right? I have right. a very good friend who's working in an all black work environment. And she and I talk all the time about the chaos and shenanigans inside yeah. of there. And it's primarily, yeah. it's primarily women and how these black women um, ostracize people, her because she's not a member of the sorority that a lot of them are in, right? Yes. And there's yes. all kinds of things. People will always seek to find a reason to want to feel superior to someone else. They And if yeah. they can't use race, they'll use something else. And what so a lot of us think we have this moral high ground that we don't have at all because we are just, we don't want to be treated bad. We don't want to be treated bad because of our race, but we're perfectly comfortable going after other people because of their orientation, going Class. after other people because of their gender identity, going after other people because they're younger or older, going yep. after other people because they're light skin or dark skin. We don't have no problem doing that because our empathy is also over time being over compromised. Time. Being compromised. Over time. So the conversation is yes, whether white people can be, um, can be taught empathy, but my question also is, what can we do not to lose ours? Because I'm really concerned about whether, you know, we're also losing our ability to be yeah. empathetic in this, in, this, in this society. So when I think about empathy, I think about empathy from a place of behaviors, right? Um, there's behavioral empathy and then there's emotional empathy, right? And so can some white people be removed from the emotional empathy piece that is natural, that I feel is natural to a lot of black people? Yes but they can learn behavioral empathy, right? Anything that can be taught, can anything that you learn, can be taught, you can learn anything. And, and empathy is no different. And that's why when I created the empathy scorecard, I created it from a place of behaviors, right? Not from, do you feel? How much do you feel for the gay people? How much do you feel for the black people? How much do you feel for the trans people? I did my, my empathy scorecard is not based on anybody's feelings. It's talking specifically about your behaviors that demonstrate that you have empathy for the uh, for the person on the other side of you, right? And so, yes, they can be taught empathy, right? Behavioral empathy is a thing. We don't talk about behavioral empathy because we only talk about empathy from what the dictionary says. Now, as for us not losing our empathy, we have to be very mindful that when we're having conversations or other Black people are having conversations like I do on TikTok and you do here on YouTube, that we don't come into a space with other Black people to assert our superiority. We have to think about the language that we are using, right? And how are we using that language around people and against people who are different than us? Because to your point, before a genocide could happen, before um, hurting somebody can happen, before raping somebody can happen, before gentrification can happen, the first thing that has to happen is you have to start dehumanizing those people and make them not worthy of the space, the life you live. And so if we as black people keep doing that over time, our, that, that, that feeling from white people is gonna move to black people, black people who are poorer than us, black people who are not as educated as, black people who are not straight, black people who are not Christian, black people who are not you know heterosexual. We start moving the goalposts about who we will be empathetic towards. And I see it a lot in my comment section as well. 
I'll have black people come and say, we need to stop talking to these people. Why do we have, why do we keep talking to them? We just need them to leave us alone. And I was saying, how can white folks leave us alone? We are 14% of the population, right? And so if we are 14% of the population, how are they going to leave us alone? How is that possible, right? So even if you make the decision not to engage with white people in your personal life, you're going to engage with them at work. You're going to engage with them when you go to the hospital. You're going to engage with them if you need um, to call the, the police. You're going to engage with them at the pharmacy. You're going to be engaging with white people. And so coming into Black people's space who are having these conversations to help white people develop and build empathy and say, we need to stop talking to them. How does that serve you? How yeah. does that serve all the other Black people that are going to be engaging with the white people you think we should stop talking to? Be because it's not realistic. For example, you know, I live in Mexico. Yeah. And I live in a place where there's a significant number of uh, white immigrants. They call themselves expats. I call them immigrants, just like I mm -hmm. call myself an immigrant. And so I have had to learn to now, I put a lot of boundaries. I believe boundaries and boundaries, as you know. So yes. I, but I have boundaries around how I deal with everyone, not just yeah. white people. I have well, very- Well, the self-empathy scorecard talks about boundaries. So on, on one of my scorecards, I talk specifically about boundaries because I think people think to have boundaries is to not have empathy, but mm -hmm. to have boundaries is a demonstration of your own self empathy. Yes. Exactly. And so I have, when I talk about boundaries, I don't just mean for white people, I have boundaries for everyone about how I interact Everybody. with people, who I give yeah. access to me, how I allow people to treat me, right? And so I am very firm in the way that I deal with people, in, including white people. So if they come to me in a way that I think is out of line, disrespectful, I, I, I do not tolerate it. But I also, you know, I, I witnessed the other, other night an interaction where someone who was white came up to a group that I was with and they were, be, they were very friendly. They did not do the show me your black card, um, you know, your black, your freedom papers thing that a lot of white people do when they see groups of black people gathering. Yeah. But the person was genuinely just, you know, you know, some people had signed from the group and he wanted to compliment the people. And then he he started by telling us about himself, which I appreciated, where he was from, his family, blah, blah, blah. And then he, you know, was asking, invited us to come to something, another um karaoke show. We were at karaoke. But I saw this one black woman in the group really stiffen up from the time he walked up. I could see, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And me and my friend, who's also a black woman, we spoke to him, we interacted with him. It was a very pleasant interaction. He's a nice guy, right? And eventually he asked, you know, whether we were living here because he was visiting, you know, whether we lived here, whether we were visiting. But I, and her response was really terse and angry, right? And we all kind of looked at her because we were like, well, what's the matter with you, right? But when he walked away, she went, you know, and, and she was like, you know, she, she hates when they come up and whatever. And I said to her, one of the most, you can move to another country, you can do all these things and still not be free. Because if every time a white person comes across your path, it, it ruins your whole day, your mind isn't free. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so what I said to her is, I do an, a very quick assessment of white people when they come into my orbit that mm -hmm. I then determine how I'm going to deal with them. I said, right. he did not reflect any of the behavior that it would have caused me to, to be upset. So there's no reason for me to be upset. I'm yeah, not reflectively yeah. angry as soon as I see a white person show up. I said, yeah, Anita, yeah. Should you be? because otherwise they're still hold, they're still enslaving you, right? Yes, you, yes. you don't live in America anymore, but you're still reacting. So I told her, you're going to have to do some work to figure out how to get past this stuff. Otherwise you're not going to be able to be happy. Right. right? And, and this isn't about them. It's about you. It's about you. It's about you. And People so, come in my comment section and say all the time, you're so patient. And I'm like, I'm not, I am patient, but I'm not patient because it's a white person. I'm patient because white people don't bother me. Yeah. And, and, and it's not that I haven't been harmed by white people, particularly in the workplace, you know, this, Anne. so it's not that I haven't been harmed by white people. I just, I, they just don't, they don't orbit my world in the way that they do for some black people. And I, I, I think black people need to understand that if white people are orbiting your world so that you have the reaction that that black lady had at the table, that that's a you thing. Mm -hmm. That yeah. that That's a go in thing, right? And I, I, I just think 
when we talk about empathy specifically, that we have to, we have to get everybody engaged in this conversation. Because my question typically to black people is, okay, so if I am talking about empathy, right? And, and 10 white people come into the room with me, right? Let's say it's 20 people in the room, 10 are black and 10 are white. And the white folks come into the room, into that conversation with me to talk about empathy, to do the scorecard, to start to do the work. But the black people on the other side of this conversation has disengaged and decided not to engage in the work. What gets resolved there? Nothing. What gets resolved? Like nothing gets resolved. So when I say both groups have to come into conversations with empathy, and this is both groups in, in any capacity, whether it's you and your husband, you and your girlfriends, mom and child, everybody has to come to the to the to the conversation with a baseline level of empathy. And that is I will at least actively listen to you. I will at least actively listen to you. If we could just start from that place to actively listen to one another so that we can gauge who you're interacting with. What is the level of engagement you need to give? Like you said, you assess pretty quickly how much you're going to engage and how you engage. But part of that is to actively listen. So you were actively listening to what he was saying, how he was saying it, and the questions he was asking. She wasn't even actively listening. All no. she saw was a white body come to the table and she turned off her ears. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I understand where it comes from, right? As but do I. I think that in order to function in this world as a free human being, because that's what I tell people, what are, what are you? I'm free. And I'm if you're free. functioning as a free human being, no one should be able to take up that much, take that much intellectual um, energy out of you or any other kind of energy out of you. Correct. Right? Just by showing up. And, you know, I often say to people, I believe, and this is just my opinion, that whiteness and white supremacy is just as harmful to white people as it is to the rest of us. It just harms us in very visceral ways. But imagine right. going through life, believing something that is inherently not true about yourself and believing right. that you deserve things that you don't deserve, right? And how hard it has to become when you over time realize for yourself that it's not true. I, I was about to say, could you imagine running headfirst into a truth that you didn't know, that you are not indeed special. You no. are not indeed better, right? And that the only thing that separates you from the black people you've been told that you are better at is, is pigmentation, right? But when, when you think about the status of your life, you are living the exact same life underneath capitalism as black people and brown people. And so to look up and go, so the thing that's supposed to be make me better is only my skin, but I'm having the exact same experience under this thing called capitalism. Like that's a truth that a lot of people are, are coming to grips with. And, and I don't think, listen, white people have been living in a delusion of superiority for centuries. And do you think reconciling that what they believe was not true is going to be met with radical acceptance of that truth? I don't, oh. I don't know what to tell it's, you. That's not denial, going to happen. The mass denial that we see happening now yes, is yes. direct response to their recognition that, that they've been lied to. But the they've been lied to. But, to be, but the refusal and or inability to accept yeah. that, that, it, that they've been told a lie. So their reaction to that is, the powers that be reaction to that is, is to double down on the lie, right? Because yeah. they have been telling the lie all this yeah, time. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So let's 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 take the books out of the library. Let's rewrite history. Let's do yes. everything we can do because these people are beginning to wake up to the lie. Right. And the visceral reaction from the people waking up to the lie is that I don't like the truth. And I don't so like I'm it. Gonna just wrap my legs around it like a person trying to climb a coconut tree and hold on for their life to the lie, because to accept the truth means I have to accept a whole lot of other things. Right. right? So they'd rather say. You know, a lot of white people would rather say, well, this is that means racism doesn't exist because I'm going through the same thing as a black person than realizing that the thing is that it does exist because all this time you've been told that the reason this person is poor is because they're black and they're lazy. Exactly. So lazy because and you're realizing, but you're poor. You're Are poor. you lazy too? Yeah. Right. All these things that you've been told, because I believe as you and I know this is as much about class, if not more so. It is. It's 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 always been about class. Their status, right? Yeah. And so they've got to make you hate people who are poor. They've got to yeah. make you hate people who are black. They've got because if you woke up to the reality of who's really screwing you over, 
all hell would break loose up in this camp and not just here, everywhere, right? right? Yeah. So you've got to maintain the lie. You've got to believe the lie. As one of my favorite lines from the lie, wire, then you got to die on the lie. Yeah. You done told you the lie. To. You got to die yeah. on the lie, even though you know it's a lie, right? And I, 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 yeah. I, th I think to your point about believing the lie and dying on the lie is why a lot of white people stop themselves from actually developing empathy. Because yeah. empathy is only going to really highlight that lie. Mm -hmm. Empathy is really just going to, you're going to run smack face into how much you have been lied to based on your race. Right. And so I think for a lot of white people, it is, that can't be true. This can't be true. And so if it can't be true, then why am I having the same experience? And I am white. And what I've been talking about on TikTok uh, to, to the people that follow me is that it has always been about class. Like this, this country was founded on a class sy system before a racial one. It was a class system before they came and grabbed us from, from Africa to do most of the work. They had the indentured Irish people doing the work, right? Like they, it was always about class because those people shared the same pigmentation with them. Right. Mm -hmm. And then when the, the, the indentured servants, the Irish and the Africans and the, the, the Chinese started looking around and saying, wait a minute. The have not to screw wing all of us in walks the separation by race, the mm -hmm. bacon rebellion mm -hmm. in, in walks race. And then all of a sudden you give white people something. Cause somebody was like, well, when I was talking about, it, it's about class. I've had people say, well, it, it isn't just about class because they have privilege. I said, well, the, the system wouldn't work if you didn't give them some privilege, what would make them uphold the system, right? If they didn't get any privileges in the system. So the privileges will give you guns, right? And we'll make you the police. We'll mm -hmm. make you the fire chiefs. We'll mm -hmm. make you the teachers and we'll give you power to continue yep. to keep the people below you. But it's always been about class and yep. white people, are, some white folks are waking up to this knowledge that holy crap, this is about class because I worked as hard as my black neighbor and we're both living in the same situation. More and more is getting stripped from us. So I tell people that the only way out is through community and the only way you build community is through empathy and that's, that's it. what a lot of us don't i mean and i know you know i can't wait to see the comments a lot of us are very resistant to that because i you know i've i've raised the issue before in some of my um videos about how whiteness came to be in the first place and the, the fact that the irish weren't always white and yeah. how yeah. chinese were br brought here to build the red rose in the west and, and what, what will people pop into my comments and say, oh, well, you know, black people built the rail, railroads too. I'm like, but this is not about that. Yeah. And your inability, the desire to engage in oppression Olympics, instead of understanding the point that's being made about the fact that you're not the, we're not the only people who have been um, victims and oppressed. And yeah. the idea that you can't see that to me says something about your level of empathy, right? Yeah. You have to be able to see that throughout history, they started with the, the people who were here when they got here. And yeah. if they figured out a way to enslave them, they wouldn't have went all the way across the ocean blue to get us. Right. They tried to enslave them. They couldn't. It they, was couldn't. they were killing them. They were dying right. too fast. Right. Correct. So they had to go find somebody else. They brought in indentured servants. They brought in slaves. It wasn't just one group of people they brought in. They brought in Correct. lots of different people. Correct. To, to get as and, and the idea that they could pay some of them nothing versus paying one some of them a half a pence apply. You know, you know, they like yeah, yeah. that idea. Right. Yeah, but yeah. the idea that it's just one group of people, right? And that if you mention anybody else, oh my God, how dare you mention the Chinese? How dare you yeah. mention Irish? Because it doesn't fall into the narrative that I want to have, that I'm the only group of people, that we're the only group of people who've been oppressed. It's not. We're not. Because it's, not. it's a system that that grow, that grow grows money off of oppressing groups of people. Correct. Right? Groups. Can't work. Groups. And groups of people, and it can't work. Look at the coal mines. Have you ever yeah. spent time reading about that? It's horrible. It's horrible. And they just the people that look like them. So what do you and, think they're going to do to other people? So I'm just like, you've got to be able to understand that this is a system and it's not just black people, right? But what, what they did so well, the genius of the system is that they still found a way to say, well, you, but you're, but you're, but you're not black. You may be Chinese and we don't, we've passed whole laws. So after you build our railroads, you can't come any no more. You can't come here. 
right? Because we've got what we need from you. But yeah, at yeah. least they're not black, right? That they've been able to come up with all these different narratives to pit different groups of oppressed Again. against, each, against other each other so that they yeah. can continue to be rich. And the yeah. rest of us sit here and we fight over a little chair at a table because we don't even have more, you know, the whole, even half the chairs, but we're right. fighting each other, right? right. And, and letting ourselves be pitted against each other. I mean, this whole conversation about who's black and who's not and foundational black people and descendants of slaves, it's, it's insane to me. Someone yeah. coming to tell me I'm not black American because my parents weren't slaves in America. So does it count that their family was slaves somewhere else? I mean, and it's like it's listen, so I, weird to me. It's so I've gotten that too. This desire I've, to separate ourselves. I, we talk about yeah. them, we're doing the same thing. We're doing because the same thing. Because this is what black people have to understand that there's no way you could be born and raised in America or even in the Caribbean, any place where slavery existed and whiteness had its stronghold. There's no way to be born into those places and not be conditioned into the system too, right? Mm -hmm. And so we just, black people just practice class. I mean, we, we, we separate ourselves through classism and elitism. What sorority do you belong to? What school did you go to? What degrees do you have? You know, what color is your skin? What's the texture of your hair? We just, we just engage in it mm -hmm. without race being the factor of it, but we still engage in the same thing because we're all conditioned into oh. white supremacy and to believe that the only group that has to work on empathy is white people is such a fallacy. Like we all have to do it. And part of my work is saying, we all have to come to the table with empathy. We all have to come to the table with empathy. We have to engage in dialogue from a place of empathy. We have to offer understanding each other's perspective from a place of empathy. We have to have emotional responses that are appropriate to, em to empathy, we have to use empathetic language when we're talking to one another. We have to help each other. We have to recognize emotions in other people. We have to recognize that if I'm having a conversation with you, Anne, and all of a sudden I can see that you're getting emotional, do I recognize that? Like when people have empathy, you ever been talking to somebody and you're starting to get emotional and it's like the person didn't even recognize that your emotions change. They didn't even recognize that you were having a moment that person deeply lacks empathy. Like you can't even recognize emotions in other people. And then finally, what I talk about on the scorecard, because I just kind of went through the sections on the scorecard, is apologizing and forgiving. Apologizing and forgiving. You can't adequately display empathy. You can't adequately embody empathy without apologizing and forgiving. And we don't, we, we've gotten to a place where even if some folks, white folks, gay folks, whoever, even if those people came and apologized to you, your empathy is so you cut off, mm -hmm. you wouldn't even accept the apology. And forgiving doesn't mean that I, I like to say, I, I'll forgive you, but I don't refuck with you, right? Mm -hmm. Like I can forgive people and not mess with them, mm -hmm. but we're not even in a place to, to apologize or forgive. And until we get to a place where everybody comes to the table, everybody comes to the table with empathy, I don't think we resolve any of the major issues of the day. I think the reason why our world is the way it is and it's in the state that it's in is because we have allowed empathy to be eroded in us. Yep. I we, ha we have allowed it to be eroded in us. And I know, this is what I know, the same what I think. I know that if people really de developed and cultivated empathy in, in themselves, that our world would look different. Your organizations would look different. Your family dynamics would look, look different. Your friendship dynamics would look different because empathy, there's a, um, it is a softening of you to accept and hear things that are different. Yep. That's when, exactly. when I come into a conversation, I am softer when I go into that conversation because I am prepared to listen. I am prepared to hear what the other person is saying to me. And, you know, one of the things that I talk about from an empathy perspective, because people are like, well, I, I just don't get it. And I'm like, I can understand somebody's perspective and not agree with it. Yep. Because understanding somebody's understanding somebody's perspective is not an endorsement of that perspective. And I think that's where a lot of people get stuck in that empathy piece. Mm -hmm. Because if they if they can at least understand the person's perspective, then they feel like they're agreeing with it. And it's like, or endorsing it. And it's like, I, I just understand it. I understand how you got to that frame 
of thinking. Yes. I understand why you believe that. That doesn't mean that I endorse it. It doesn't even believe mean I believe it, but I can at least understand why you think that and believe that. And and to some degree, I can learn how to navigate around you better because but I at least I understand add, where you're I coming add from. Can I something else to that? Yeah. I also think that understanding doesn't mean acceptance. And people Correct. have the idea that by being understanding of someone who's different from them, they have, they're accepting it. it yeah. You don't have to accept it. I don't have to understand somebody's choices to, 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 to say that they have a right to make those choices. Correct. I don't agree with their choices to say that they have a right to make those choices, even if I don't agree with them. I don't Correct. have to understand someone's lifestyle to say that they have a right to, to choose the lifestyle, even if to I choose don't choose the lifestyle and wouldn't choose it for myself. And Correct. I think the problem for too many of us, expect, including in the Black community, is that we keep confusing understanding with acceptance. Yes. Right? And that or endorsement think, of. And I'm like, nobody's endorsing. Right? Yeah. right. And I'm like, I don't have to understand someone's choices to believe that they have the right to make those choices. Because if, if they don't have a right to make their choices, then somebody's coming for my right to do be me. And to do make my I, own choices. And, 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 and if it, even out of my own self-interest, I understand that that's a problem. And, and so correct. many of us, you know, I've often say that there are many white people that would cut off their leg if they thought a black person was going to get some shoes. And yeah. I'm like, that's the thing is that you don't have to agree or accept, right? But you're going to harm your own self in service of making sure that somebody else doesn't have something. And that's where we are as a society, right? right. That's the thing that we're literally harming ourselves in service to this idea that other people shouldn't have something because of our depletion of empathy. And right? I was about to say, and the only reason why we are here is because we don't have empathy. Mm -hmm. That's why we're here, that we, we would be willing to harm ourselves. We would be willing to sacrifice our own self-interest in the hopes that the other person is going to be harmed because we have no empathy for those people. We don't see them as good as us. We don't see them as human to us. We don't see them as worthy of as us. And when you have empathy, it's, I want for other people what I want for myself. And if what I want for myself is to have the freedom to make any and all life choices that I would make as an adult woman, I want that for the person on the other side of me, which means they get to make any decisions they get to make as an adult. When you have empathy, you want for others what you want for yourself. That's the thing. So if, if I get to take away your rights or I get to say, oh, it's okay that gay people can't get married. Oh, it's okay that gay people can't adopt. Eventually somebody's going to come for my rights. Yep. And I, you know, I said this. That's what um, we you know, I said in the last video about whiteness that I did, I talked about it as being, to me, white supremacy and wh whiteness being a tree, right? Yeah. And we are all satisfied to just cut the branches we don't like. Yeah. The ones we don't like, right? We cut that branch off. We'll cut this one off because we don't like that one. But yeah. we don't want to cut down the tree and ground out the stump. And the only way you kill a tree, it ain't even to cut it down because it regenerates itself. Yeah. I used to be an avid gardener. It regenerates itself. You got to cut it down and ground out the stump to kill that sucker. Sometimes you got to put some fire in there. You got to pour something in there to kill the roots and everything and yeah. ground it out. We yeah. don't want to do that. We just want to cut the parts that we don't like, not realizing that unless we cut the tree and ground the stump, the, the branch is going to grow back. Right. The and cutting the tree cut and grounding the stump. Back. We don't want to see that because we only care about the part that impacts us, but we don't care about the part that impacts other people. And I always tell people equal under protection, equal protection under the law means equal protection under the law for everyone, not just for the people everyone. you like, not just the people you understand, everyone. Because if it doesn't mean that, it means that it doesn't, it's not there for anyone. Because if Correct. they can say it don't apply to this group of people, eventually they can say it doesn't apply to you using the same principles as we're seeing now that they used to say that it didn't apply to that group, right? right? So when they were coming for affirmative action, you should have known that your right to choose was going to be next. And for all of, you know, all of us who have been in interracial relationships, they coming for that next too. Nobody is going to be exempt. If they're coming for your right to choose, you're coming for your birth control next. 
right? right? And maybe even your Viagra, gentlemen. So it's like, you got to understand that it's like, it can't be one or the other. It's either you're for it or you're not for it. And right. if you're not for it, that means you're prepared to sacrifice your rights as well. And too many of us think we can just cherry pick what we what we don't like. And it don't work that way. It's yeah. either everybody gets to have rights or nobody gets to have it. That's what I said. I I, I was talking to um, Etta, the, the woman that's doing some of the marketing around the empathy scorecard. And I said to her, I said, if for me to be free, I have to watch you um, unalive somebody else. Take us both. Take us both. So when, when we live in a society that says, I don't want that person to die. And if you're going to kill them, kill me too. There's so much of us they can kill. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like there's so much, they, they need bodies to be workers. So they can't take us all. But if we get to a place that I, what I want for myself is what I want for the person across from me. So if if I have if my freedom is contingent on somebody else's life, then that's not a freedom I want because eventually that thing is going to come back around and they're mm -hmm. going to come to take mine. And yep. the only thing that grounds that out to to your point is when we get to the root and we pour into that hole a whole lot of empathy. Mm -hmm. So that and, so that thing doesn't regenerate itself. That. And that's what worries me is so many of us, and it's not just white people, right? Yeah. I think, because I think what you said is true. There's behaviors that can be taught. There's but behaviors. What I feel is that we as black people have the, have had the benefit of not just having the feelings, but all the also the behavior. And I'm yeah. worried that we're losing both. We are. We're we losing are. Both. I, I, I see it. And, and, and that worries me at, because a lot of, of what we have said is uh, that we're invested in um, the idea that it should only be us, right? It should only be us. That, that, that can talk about oppression yeah. and that um, we should only talk about these things from the prism of one, one thing. And it's not just one thing. The yeah, way not just that one thing. and white supremacy shows up is in multiple different ways. That's why it's so hard to fight. Because that is, it is. Because it, it morphs. It morphs itself. It morphs. It's, That's what I tell people. Every time you do one it thing, morphs. Here, it morphs yeah. because it was designed to be what it is, right? Yeah. So you you do this one thing, you pass all these laws in the 1960s to say that it's not okay to discriminate against people based on all these different classes and characteristics. And then the system turns around and uses that to literally, right, keep the discrimination. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It morphs itself. White morphs supremacy is itself into something else every single it's, time. It every single does. time. Every single time. And it morphs itself in the people for whom it's we've been conditioned under. Like there's no I say to black people all the time. Do you think white people are the only people indoctrinated into white supremacy when you live in a country in a system built on it? Of course we are indoctrinated in it as well. This is why we talk about anti-blackness in the black community. This is why we talk about colorism in the black community. This is why we talk about homophobia in the black community. It's all white supremacy morphed into something else to still oppress. And so whether you oppress people because their skin is darker than yours or their hair texture is tighter than yours, or they don't have a bunch of degrees like you, or they don't live in the same neighborhood as or you. Or the reverse, or you're discriminating against somebody because their skin is light or their yes. skin is greater than yours. Exactly. Because, because all, that all the things. Too. And, and, and let me touch the third all rail the thing. That happens too, right? It does. And we have to recognize that all of these things happen and why and where they're coming, what the motivation of it is and where it is coming from. It right. can't be freedom for me and not for thee. It can't be, you can't do that for, to me, but I should be able to do it to you because you did, because people that look like you did all these things before. So I'm justified. It don't right. work that way. And that's what worries me is I'm seeing more and more this idea that we can punish people that we feel have benefited more than we have. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and I'm like, that, that's not the, the purpose of getting free is not to punish other people. Exactly. Listen, Again, if my freedom is contingent on somebody else being enslaved, that's not freedom. That is not freedom, right? And hate is such a heavy, hate is so heavy. It's funny because when I was with Etta over the weekend, I mean, this past week, and we were talking about, she was like, I had something happen to me and I 
I could feel myself pulling back on my empathy. And the question I asked, her, I said, and how does that feel in your body? And she looked at me, she caught the head. She was, I was like, how does that feel in your body when you pull away from empathy? I said, it feels heavy, doesn't it? And she said, yeah. I said, because when you are empathetic, I said, there's a lightness in your body, right? Like when we, when we talk about things like empathy, when we talk about being free, there's a lightness in your body. And she said, when I was empathetic and when I was caring and I was giving, she goes, I did show, I I, yeah, I felt lighter. Like my body felt lighter. And she says, as I been, begin to pull back from my empathy, it does feel heavy. I said, because hate and distrust is heavy. Like, I, I don't think, I think we, we talk about like the mind body connection, but we don't talk about it from a place of empathy. When you are operating in empathy, real genuine empathy, you are lighter. Your body physically is lighter. You feel it emotionally. You are lighter. When you decide you're not going to be empathetic to, to white folks, cause they're the devils. When you decide you're not going to be empathetic to the gay people because they are um an, an abomination. When you decide you're not going to be empathetic to the, like, that's heavy. That's not just heavy in your spirit. You feel that in your body. And a lot of us are walking around sick in our bodies, mm -hmm. sick in our bodies because, because of what we are carrying and we refuse to let it go. But I am, like I said, I just show up in the world differently because I really practice empathy. It's not just about me feeling it. I practice it. I practice it in the way that I listen to people. I practice it in the way that I understand people's perspective. I practice it in the way that I am emotional responsive. To, I practice it. And so because I practice it every day, I am lighter when I walk out into the world. That doesn't mean that I don't have problems. That doesn't mean that things don't come up for me. I'm just fit, emotionally, I am lighter when I go into the world. And I know a lot of the, the folks that have done the empathy scorecard or have been in any of the classes that I've taught or even engaged me for work in their organization or one-on-ones, when we come to the end of our engagement, they will literally say, I don't know why, but I can't unsee what I now see. Those white folks now can see privilege in a way that they weren't able to see it before because I'm telling them to open up their eyes from, from a place of empathy. And now they're sitting in rooms and they can hear because white supremacy too, white supremacy language is a whisper in rooms if you're not paying attention. And I've had white people say to me, I can't unsee it now. It's like, I can't unhear it now, right? I can't undo it. And so that's how powerful empathy is if people really employ it in themselves. It literally changes you. It changes you. And that's what I want people to really come into this work of empathy and engage with it because it will change you. It will change your interaction with your children. One of the women that got the empathy scorecard sent me a message. And I was I was saying two, two messages that I've gotten around doing my empathy scorecard was one woman said, my husband and I got in bed and she said for the first time in a long time, we were able to have conversations without argument and without resentment. And she said, because when I got in the bed and I was asking him questions from the empathy scorecard about how well I listen and how well he listens, she was like, it brought the temperature down. Because if I walked into that conversation and say, you don't really listen to me, I feel like you never understand my perspective, right? Every time I say something, there's no emotional response from you. She said, if I walked into that conversation just as his wife, defenses would have gone up. In the same way that if he came into a conversation with me, my defenses would have gone up. But we're sitting in bed and we're asking each other's questions from the empathy scorecard. And then we're saying to each other, what do you think about my answer? Do you think that's true? And she goes, I don't know that you intended this empathy scorecard to do that in terms of relationship building, but I just wanted to tell you thank you because it has made conversations with my husband a lot easier than, than ever before. And I am now engaging with my husband from a place of empathy and he's now engaging with me from that place. Yeah. I created the tool just as a self-evaluation. But when you when you truly get engaged with empathy, it changes your relationships. It changes the way that you show up in the world. It changes the way that you engage with people. And I, you know, to, to your point on this call is that I, I really want to implore Black people. Black people, the thing that separated Black people from most people is our deep humanity and empathy. And if we sacrifice that at the altar, because let me let me explain to you, Black people, when you sacrifice your alter, your empathy, you're sacrificing your empathy at the altar of white supremacy. Yep. 
the same white supremacy you say you hate so much, the same white supremacy you say you're trying to dismantle, the same white supremacy you keep telling everybody is harming you. When you sacrifice your empathy, you're sacrificing it at the altar of white supremacy. There it is. It is, it is to me, it is imperative that we do the work to not lose that because I think yeah. it's very important to us as people. And yes, and you know, on the flip side of that, we don't want it to be exploited, which it has been exploited on many fronts. That's, that's right. where you get to the self-empathy scorecard. Right. And, but and, it's important and, to not yeah. understand how to now allow it to be exploited without losing it, right? Without losing it. Without losing it. And so I think it's important, you know, I think, you know, this scorecard is very important for us to, to have and to yeah. get. Um, because I think it's crucial that we as black people not lose our empathy. I think it's very important for white people to learn some, yeah. right? It has yeah. been bred out of them. Over, it over has time. been bred out of them. It, it has been bred out of them. And it, the things that have happened in this world could not happen if the people at the head of it had empathy. There is no could way. Not. And it could, could not continue to happen. So there's Correct. This, question, this is not me saying that you're bad people. I'm saying it has been bred out of you. You are inside of a system that has taught you not to have it over not to have it over For generation. generation. And, yeah. and you have sympathy, but you don't have empathy. You, and it, that's exactly it. Those, but you can learn it. You can you learn it. You, you absolutely it, can learn it. You can learn it. And so, yeah. but, but, by, but to learn it, you have to recognize you don't have it. And I think that's Correct. the thing that many grapple with. They don't want to admit they don't have it. They don't want to admit they don't have it. So, at, so at, one, at, they don't want to, they don't want to even enter the conversation about learning it because they having a difficulty admitting that they don't have it in the first place. Yeah. So they don't want to have a conversation about learning it, but I think it's very important to realize that you don't have it in the way that you should just by the things that you're not doing to address but, what's going on. That's exactly it. By the things that you are not doing. And one of the things I tell white folks all the time, I said, you have to, to your point, Anne. You have to admit you don't have it. And, and and here's the thing. I said, when we live in a country where we are, we would be demonized if we don't have the appropriate emotional response to the bad thing on the news. People have been acting out an emotional response that isn't coming from a true place of having an emotional response. I said, and until you can tell the truth about that, like, I'm saying I feel bad that that thing happened. I'm saying how terrible it is, but I really don't feel anything. Mm -hmm. I don't really feel what I think I should feel. Until you can admit that, any work that you think you're doing around empathy will not get done. Any you work want, you, you think you're doing know around that it. I knew that we didn't that that, that that there was none. Yeah. Sandy Hook. That's when I knew. Yes. Sandy Hook yes. Is what told me that the that that the, collectively there was no empathy. Because yeah. if you can see little children be murdered in school, in a place where they should be safe. And not raise hell. You accept your government not doing anything. You accept it. You say, well, you know, I would like them to do something, but they haven't done anything. The president is demanding that the Congress do anything, but they haven't done anything. But I'm okay with it. Yeah. That people it's true. Didn't march on the Capitol for that. They marched on the Capitol on January 6th, but they didn't march on the Capitol for that with pitchforks and axes. Yeah. That's when I said, this country it's a done deal with this country. That's when I was like, I got to get out of here. Cause some, yeah. this is something that's inherently sick. Inherently sick. That, and you don't, you, you say how sad it is and thoughts and prayers, how sad it is, but you take no action whatsoever. But you ain't blowing up the spot. One, no action whatsoever to do anything yeah. about it, to, to, to reflect your displeasure, to display your displeasure. Right. Yeah. That's when you're like, what in the hell is wrong? Right. That there is there is something that should be there that isn't there. Right. Yeah. And so it is very important for people to recognize that that's something that has been taken from you and you should yes. want it back. that it's been taken from you from a system and you should want it back. You should want it back and you, you should be fighting and doing everything to get it back to cultivate it in yourself. One of the videos that I did on TikTok and I was talking about like how empathy has been bred out of white people. And it was so startling. And I hate that I didn't save this video, but there was a white woman on there and she was talking about 
her father. Okay, so when I when I came to Florida, I had heard the stories of black babies being fed to alligators. But I I thought honestly, I was like, this has to be made up. Like, there's no way that this that level like this can't be a real thing. Like, this is a folks tale that just kind of started from somewhere, and people just kept repeating it. This can't be real because nothing in my humanity would make me believe that people would, would do something that cool, right? And so I come on TikTok, it was like two years ago, and this video comes down and it's this white woman talking about her grandfather being one of the white men that actually fed babies to alligators. And she said her mother, when her mother was little, her grandfather would take her mother with him and want, make that child watch him do that. And he would say to the child, if you feel bad for them or if you say anything, this will happen to you. And he would make her mother watch him rape young black babies and young kids before feeding them to the alligator. And I'm like, that kind of breeding out to tell you not to care for people who are different than you, that those that the people who look different than you are deserving of that level of violence and that level of hatred, right? When I look at photos of lynchings, mm -hmm. I'm looking at the young faces. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the young faces in that crowd. Like I, I want people to go back, just, Go on your Googles and, and and just grab a photo of, of, of a body and the lynching. Look at the faces in the crowd. That That is a systematic conditioning empathy out of people. Like that happened over generations and centuries. Mm -hmm. Generations. And it is systematic to breed it out of them. And because that's just how they have shown up in the world. That's just how everybody around them is. They don't recognize that they don't have empathy. Because they're in white communities, in white bubbles, in white spaces, and everybody operates the way they do. Everybody operates the way they do. So a lot of them don't even recognize that they don't have empathy. The amount of people that messaged me after doing the scorecard that said, I went into this, to this test thinking I was really, really empathetic, and boy, did it slap me in the face. Boy, did it slap me in the face. And I'm like, a lot of us think we have empathy, not just white people, black people, Asian people, brown people, Christians think they have it. Oh, Lord. Well, we're going to have a whole separate conversation about Christianity and whiteness and white supremacy. And old people are going to be upset. We're going to, that's the, that's another, we're going to have another conversation about that. Because you you know, I'm always ready for that conversation. We're going to have that conversation and it's going to hit a third rail with, with a lot of people. But I think we need to have that conversation as we well. We need to have that conversation. Um, but I think that the point that you're making is right. And I mean, this is why I wanted you to do this conversation with me because for me, it's the, you know, it wasn't just the question of can white people learn it, which both of us agree they can learn it. They have lost yeah. it, but they can yeah. learn it if they, they, yes. they, they, they desire to. But also, are we losing it? We are. It the other side of that question. And what we can are. we do to make sure we don't, right? We are losing it. Yeah, we are losing it as, as a people. I see that you, we are you, you see it in your comment section and I see it in my comment section. One generation to the next, we are losing it. And that is a big concern to me, right? Yeah. Um, and so it's really important for us to not only recognize that other people don't have it, but to recognize the loss of it in ourselves. The loss of it in ourselves. And I think for Black people specifically, I think Black people see... Um, the loss of their empathy as self-preservation in a system that is constantly harming them, mm -hmm. right? But the problem with that thinking is if you lose it in yourself, you're just going to perpetuate harm on somebody else. And more likely somebody that looks like you because that's who you more have. More likely somebody who looks like you. Children. You have, your children. You, yes. All yes. of it. So it's not, so losing the empathy uh, uh, around whiteness because whiteness harms us. We know that whiteness harms us. But the more you allow your empathy be eroded because whiteness is harming you, you will harm other people. You yeah. will harm people who are darker than you, people who are lighter than you, people who are thinner than you, pe people who are fatter than you, people who are gay, people who are trans. You will end up turning that loss of empathy in yourself and you will harm others. You will harm others. And I see it a lot. Oh, yeah. I see it a lot, particularly in my comment sections. And I hear right? it. I hear it in the stories from my clients and my potential clients because I am noticing how often now the stories that I'm being told about the dysfunction and the discrimination in workplaces are featuring people like us, either yes. as the central player 
or as a supporting cast member. Yes. Right. A that lot of us are playing. We are becoming handmaidens of whiteness right. and white supremacy because we are we are seeking that proximity to that. And so yeah. when we get power, how we are using it is okay, harmful. So, so I'm gonna say this too. The reason why I think a lot of black folks are losing their empathy too, particularly when you get into the corporate space, because that level of power requires it to be stripped out of you. And that's the not thing we're always, not talking not about. Not always. What I'm saying is not always. It, there is a choice. I was yeah. an executive for many, many years, and you're faced with choices. And it's well, that, about okay. So, so your choice was I'm not going to allow that to be me. But a lot of us don't make that choice. Yeah. Because because when you get to the top of that system, part of that is you can't show yeah. up in that space with no with a bunch of empathy. That ain't gonna work. That's not going to work. So when I say definitely are you 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 come at def they're definitely inflection points as I call them. Yes, so you yes. have to make choices. You you have because, to make choices. You are constantly asked to make compromises, to compromise Always. your ethics, to compromise Always. your morals. Um, Always, and, and so, I think every black person will will agree to that. Like when you, you get have to make choices, and unfortunately, I would say most of the people I've interacted, not just black people, all yeah, of yeah. Them, all, all, all of us, yeah. all of us, all of us. I always tell people there's nobody. There are two things I always say. There's nobody who's rich who has clean hands. I don't care what they look like. Yeah. And there's no one who's ever become president who has clean hands, including y'all yeah. beloved Barack Obama. To yeah. get to these places, there are compromises that people have to make that would keep the average person awake, not just for, oh, from sleep for the rest of their lives. There is... There are compromises that people have to make in order to sit in those rooms and to get to those places that yeah. you might not want to make. You might want what they have, but you won't want to do the things that they've had to do to get there, right? And the first thing you're going to have to check at the there. door. Not just to get there, but, but to, to stay, stay there. That, that's that's what, that, not the getting that's there, my point. it's the staying there. That's my point. Any person, black or white, when you get to certain levels of power, the first thing that got to get checked at that door is your empathy. That empathy doesn't work in those spaces. And that's why I keep saying to, to those of us down at the bottom, we better we, we better get together quickly and we, we can't do that if we don't have empathy, right? Like if, if Black people, white people, brown people, Asian people really put down supremacy, I'm talking about put it down, and picked up empathy, the game is over, Anne. Oh, yeah. The game is over. And the reason why the game isn't over is because we have been conditioned not to have empathy for people who don't look like us, yeah. people who don't love like us, people who don't worship like us, people who don't live like us, right? Exactly. And if we put that down and collectively picked up empathy for one of the game is over. Would so there's over. a vested interest in us not developing empathy, right? So we, we get all of these, listen, you go on YouTube, you can find all kinds of conversations that that's designed to continually separate us, right? Whether we are um, the Israelites or whether we are the more superior race, find the conversations. It's going to continue to tell us in some way that we are somehow better. Yeah. Whether we are somehow better as black people, somehow better as white people, somehow better as Asian, Indians, there's always going to be a conversation around how we are somehow better. And the more that we engage in those conversations and the more we engage in those activity, the less empathetic we are to people who do not look like us. And if we can get that, game's over. Game's All over. Right. So that's why I created both the empathy scorecard because I wanted people to sit with, do I really have empathy? And out of that came the self-empathy scorecard because not just do you have empathy outside for people who don't look like you, but do you have it for yourself? And part of that self-empathy is what you talked about earlier is setting clear boundaries around you so can that you, you aren't people, abused. Thank you, Karen, Tammy. Can you tell people how to get your empathy scorecard? So for those of you who want to get the empathy scorecard, you can go to my website. I think Anne will put it in the description. Yes. It's pcqconsulting.com um, and then click on empathy scorecard and you can grab it from there. Um, it is a self-evaluation tool. You can take it as many times and I encourage people to take it over and over again. And I encourage people to take it in context. And what I mean by take it in context, a lot of people can take this empathy scorecard in context. When I'm at work, how empathetic am I? So when you're answering those questions, think about yourself sitting in, in a workplace setting. 
when I'm with my kids, how empathetic am I when I'm with my spouse? Because one of the questions was like, I was thinking about this when I was taking the scorecards. I want people to take it in all the different contexts in your life, all the important areas of your life, work, church, children, relationship. And the goal is that eventually, no matter who you are engaging with, you are empathetic across the board. Not I have more empathy for this group. When I'm this person, I got more empathy here. I got less empathy there. And so take it as many times as you need to. And I tell people, check in with yourself periodically. You know, come back to the scorecard three to three months, six months, and take it again and see where you sit. See if you've improved in areas of empathy or you have declined in areas of empathy. Um, and it's a good way to kind of to manage and monitor yourself. So I will be um, linking uh, to Tammy's website. I'll also be linking to her TikTok channel. If you're on TikTok and you're not following Tammy, I really don't know what you're doing with your life, to be honest. <laughs> Um, to see how beautiful and, and, and then you can go on TikTok and see how not just how beautiful and intelligent and sharp she is, but how fly she is, right? <laughs> Get on TikTok. So Tammy, thank you so much for taking the time to talk about, I think this is a very important topic. I think it's going to, you know, result in someone doing some, and I think many people doing some self-introspection about yeah. whether or not they are where they want to be in terms of empathy um, and I think it's, it's a very important conversation. It's going to touch some nerves and that's okay. I like to have nerve touching conversations on my, my channel. Well, you know, I do too, because my TikTok is nothing but touching nerves. Yeah. You got, you got to, you got to talk about these things because we can't address these issues if we're not willing to talk about them. So thank you so much for being here. Um, thank I'm you for having me conversations with Tammy about some other nerve touching su subjects that we, we, we need to talk about because these things impact us at work. They, yeah. they, they impact us at work. Um, and it's really important that if we want to have the workplaces that we want to have and have the interactions that we want to have at work, that we understand ourselves better and understand, you know, where a lot of these issues and problems that we're experiencing come from. Okay. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this conversation. Um, if you have, please, you know, like, subscribe, give constructive comments, govern please. yourselves. Y'all know. Govern yourselves accordingly. Yeah accordingly you know what i always say you can you can comment constructively you don't have to agree but if you start attacking me or tammy or anyone else you 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 might as well not comment cuz your comment won't stay very long and neither will you so again <laughs> comment constructively share this video with a friend and as i always say hr is not your enemy but they're definitely not your friend but i am and i'll see you guys in the next video bye